Thank you. I hope the, uh, the first part of this lecture, Marketing Milk and Disease, has at least firmly established for you that milk is not necessary for good health, at least cow's milk for human health. Now I'm going to tell you about the real negative aspects of consuming dairy products and buying into the dairy industry's very well known message, and of course one that's hi highly financed. And I can best characterize this by telling you, got milk, got disease. You know about some of the negative things concerning dairy products, and I want to just review them quickly for you. Let's take a look at the dairy products in terms of their nutritional components. Now, it's a little bit artificial what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this particular food into various, various components. And for me to say, for example, cholesterol in dairy is what causes heart disease is really not the whole story. It's really artificially separating things out. It's not just the fact that uh, dairy products or meat products that we'll talk about some other time. It's not just that the cholesterol causes rotten arteries and heart attacks. So does the saturated fat. And so does the lack of antioxidants. And so does the lack of dietary fiber. It's just the whole food itself. Whereas people do think about these in terms of separate nutrients, but realize that it's really a big picture that I want you to put together at the end when I describe all the individual problems related to dairy or other kinds of foods. You know that uh, dairy products are high calorie. I mean, after all, they're high fat. They're intended to grow a baby cow to an adult cow. And as a result, they're full of calories. And those calories, we know, promote obesity, they promote type 2 diabetes, and they also promote heart disease. We also know that these dairy products are possible promoters of cancer because of their high calorie intake. Extra calories in experimental studies promote cancer. Dairy products are high in fat, which promotes obesity and cancer and diabetes. They're high in a kind of fat that you've always learned to worry about, and that's the saturated kind or the animal kind, and that's the kind that really rots the arteries. Dairy products are high in protein. As a consequence of their high protein intake, which goes along with the high acid. Remember, proteins are made of amino acids. And some of those acids are more acidic than others, like the sulfur-containing amino acids. So dairy products, because they are high in protein, aren't they sold to you because they're high in protein? Well, there's a negative part to that. That high protein, high acid nature of dairy products, what it does is it damages the kidneys, causes kidney overload for processing all that protein. As a matter of fact, the standard classic recommendation from all kidney doctors is if you have failing kidneys, you need to go on a low protein diet to decrease the workload of those kidneys, to decrease the flow through the tubules, to preserve the kidney function so you can stay off a dialysis machine. That extra protein is harmful. As a matter of fact, even in healthy people, people who have no apparent diseases, it's estimated that they lose about a third of their kidney function by the time they get to be 70 years old because of the high protein nature of the American diet. The acid, the acid is what really damages the bones because the bones have to neutralize the acid and dairy products are high in acid. I mentioned to you that hard cheeses are very high in acid and Parmesan cheese is the most acidic food that people commonly consume. Now, how does that fit with the message that you could, should consume dairy products to have strong bones? It's ex exactly the opposite of what the scientific truth is. Dairy products are high in cholesterol, so they promote atherosclerosis, which leads to strokes and heart attacks. They're low in iron. In fact, dairy products have almost no iron in them. When somebody comes to me with a problem of iron deficiency anemia, the first thing I do is I look for a, a cause of iron loss, like blood loss. Are they bleeding from their intestinal tract, or maybe a woman bleeding from her uterus, or other sources of bleeding I would look for. Now, if I ruled that out, then the next thing I would think about, or maybe even in addition to the problem of blood loss, maybe this is compounding the problem, I'd look to whether or not they had a diet high in dairy products, because dairy products has virtually no iron, the calcium and phosphorus in dairy complexes iron from other sources like green beans and beef and forms insoluble complexes so that the iron cannot now get through the intestinal tract into the body. And the third thing that consuming dairy does is it causes bleeding in the intestinal tract. There's a problem called Heiner's syndrome that little babies have. It's the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia. Heiner's syndrome is due to cow's milk. 
for those three reasons that I just told you. These kids end up with having microscopic blood in their stool or actually gross bloody diapers. And you can't stop the anemia until you take the kids off of the dairy products. Every pediatrician, every allergist knows about Heiner's syndrome. You have to think about this in adults too that have anemia problems. Is it about due to all that dairy consumed? Or maybe blood loss in the intestinal tract from the dairy? Or maybe all the fat that's in the dairy, maybe that's causing extra hormones in their system, which is causing extra menstrual flow. A dietary solution is the one you want to look for because that, of course, is something you can easily change. Dairy products have no fiber. And because they have no fiber, they contribute to constipation. But I'm going to carry this discussion of constipation on further because there are other reasons that dairy products cause constipation other than the fact that, like all animal products, dairy products contain no dietary fiber. They're low in carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is what gives you energy. Now milk has carbohydrate, about 30% of the calories are carbohydrate, but in making cheese, the carbohydrate content is reduced to about 2%. You've heard about runners hitting the wall, running out of energy. Well, what they're basically doing is running out of carbohydrate. So if you want to be active, whether you want to be an athlete, a runner, or you just want to be just an active person. You want to be able to do your housework or your, or your work at your em employment. If you want to just be alive and active, you want to have that carbohydrate because that's where your energy comes from. And dairy products fail to supply that carbohydrate, particularly in the area of uh, low carbohydrate dairy products like your cheeses. Dairy products have no vitamin C, which results in poor tissue healing. And if it gets severe enough, low vitamin C, then you get a condition called scurvy. And it results in degenerative diseases because dairy products, the fat that they do have is of the unessential type. Remember we talked about how essential fats come from plant foods. Your omega-3 and your omega-6 fats, they come from plant foods. Well, dairy products are animal products and as a result, they don't contain many of these essential fats. As a matter of fact, 97% of the fats are the unessential saturated type. So you result in fatty acid deficiency. And there's concern that certain neurologic problems, such as multiple sclerosis, may have their foundation in feeding young kids too many dairy products and also too many other animal products. And as a result, they develop a weakened nervous system because the nervous system is made from these essential fats. And as a result, they develop a nervous system that is later on susceptible to other things, such as autoimmune problems or viruses, dairy products, are sufficient in something that they won't brag about. Dairy products, as a matter of fact, will have lots and lots of something they won't brag about, the dairy industry won't brag about, and that is environmental contaminants like DDT and PCB and heptachlor. The environmental contaminants that get into your body are a consequence of consuming high fat animal products. These environmental contaminants result in serious problems such as cancer. Breast cancer has been studied by many researchers and published in many scientific er journals as to, be, as to have been caused or promoted by these environmental chemicals. They get into you through the food that you consume and particularly the animal products. Parkinson's disease, other kinds of neurologic problems that result in you having difficulty thinking are a consequence of these environmental ke chemicals. As a result, also these ke environmental chemicals will cause hormone problems in people. Dairy products have something unique that makes them a bit different than animal foods, and that is that their proteins are highly allergenic. You may have heard that the number one cause of food allergy in children as well as adults is dairy products. You may have heard doctors say or mothers come back and tell you that you know that I took my child to a doctor with a runny nose or ear problems or other allergies. The first thing the doctor said is take them off the dairy products. Well, there are other serious allergy type problems that we call autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or type 1 diabetes that also are initiated by the dairy protein which makes them a bit unique than other animal products and also dairy products are full of microbes they're full of organisms that can cause infection let's uh, talk about this microbe thing for just a minute dairy products are pure white but one of the reasons they're white, the dairy industry will not brag about, and that's because part of their whiteness comes from white blood cells. White blood cells are commonly called pus cells. Now I want you to know that the dairy industry, they have rules. 
and they're conscientious about their products and they set up a rule back in 1993 that said that a milliliter of milk cannot contain more than a qu three quarters of a million pus cells. No more than 750,000 pus cells per cc of milk. A cc is about a thirtieth of an ounce. And I want you to know that the dairy industry, they stick by their rules. As a matter of fact, there was a study recently published where they looked at the milk in New York State and they found on average there were 363,000 pus cells per cc of milk examined. Now those white blood cells, they had to be there for a reason. They had to fight off the nearly 25,000 bacteria that were found in the milk and those bacteria were there to fight off infections that are common in the cows. I love that advertisement that they put out for the dairy industry about the milk mustache. But it's not truth in advertisement. If it was truth in advertisement, they'd have that mustache properly labeled. They'd say this milk mustache, it contains a quarter million pus cells and about 25,000 bacteria. You think you'll find a movie star or other personality carry a must milk mustache with that particular labeling on it? I don't think so. <laughs> dairy products were the most often recalled product, food product, by the FDA between October of 1993 and September of 1998. They were recalled because of contamination with microorganisms such as Salmonella, Staphylococci, Listeria, which can cause abortions and miscarriages, deadly E. coli. E. coli is the bacteria that you often hear contaminating food that will kill children. Also a bacteria called Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, which is believed to be involved in the development of Crohn's disease. There's one infection problem that the dairy industry, I believe, tries to keep quiet. I'm certain they wouldn't brag about it, and I'll never see an advertisement talking to you about this particular problem. It has to do with the infection of dairy products with bovine immunodeficiency virus. Another term for that is bovine AIDS virus, and also bovine leukemia viruses. I bet you've never heard about this. But I would think you'd want to know about this. How common is this? Well, in the United States, results showed an average of 40% of beef herds and 64% of dairy herds are infected with bovine AIDS virus. Right now, in the United States of America, nine out of 10 herds are infected with bovine leukemia viruses. In other words, you can pretty much plan if you serve a glass of milk or any other dairy product, you can pretty much plan that they're going to be infected with these bovine AIDS and bovine leukemia viruses because they take milk from various herds and they mix them up in vats and then these vats of milk from thousands of different cows go on to make the dairy products. Virtually all of the dairy products are infected. Now in Canada, the rate is 70%. Argentina, the rate of infection is 84% for bovine leukemia viruses. When you look around the world, when you find countries that depend upon dairy and beef cattle for their economy, you will find very high infection rates. This has uh, changed in one particular country. Finland started 30 years ago an eradication program and just last year, Finland announced that it has eradicated bovine leukemia viruses from its herd. So there are some parts of the world there are some governments, there are some researchers involved in making rules that really take this problem seriously. 30 years of effort and they finally cleaned up the dairy foods in Finland. Herds infected with bovine immunodeficiency virus are usually infected with bovine leukemia viruses. Now you might ask, how do these animals get infected? Well, one way is by instruments. They use the same tattooing instruments to identify the cows. They go from one cow to the next. Same syringes to give the cows medications. Same dehorning instruments. They feed pooled colostrum. They take early milk from various cows and they pool it together and they feed it to the little baby calves that happen to be in that particular herd and spread it in that manner. It can spread from mother to calf directly. But one of the interesting ways that uh, these diseases are spread in cattle was brought out in April of 1996 when Oprah Winfrey had Howard Lyman on her television show. You might know Howard Lyman, he's the mad cowboy. Wrote a book, very outspoken man. And he talked about the problem of mad cow disease on the Oprah show in 1996. And Oprah made a statement similar to, I will never eat another hamburger again. And of course that set the, the cattle industry off. And they went and sued her because of it. 
Well, they also, they also took some action based upon that particular television show and the public awareness of what was going on. What Howard Lyman exposed on that show and has been telling people about for many years is the fact that the cattle industry was doing a very bizarre practice. They were making cannibals out of cows. What they would do is they would take cows that died. They're called downer cows. They die from all kinds of problems. They're sick. And they take them and they grind them up and they put them in the cattle food and they feed them back to cows. Well, after the Oprah Winfrey show, the cattle industry got together and they said, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to put a ban on feeding cows to cows. So you think they solved the problem. Well, USA Today did a front page story in June of 2003 where they reported on really what is going on in terms of cow foods being fed to cows. And it's going to surprise you. They do have this ban that you can't feed dead cows to live cows anymore. But you can still feed dead cows to chickens and pigs. Yes. Now when chickens and pigs, they eat these, this dead cow food, which they process and they put in, in, in pellets and other forms to feed to the chickens and pigs. What happens is the chickens and pigs, they chew on this food and they, they don't chew it up completely. They drop parts of it onto the floor. And then some of that cow, that dead cow food, goes through the chicken and pigs and ends up uh, being excreted onto the cow floor, partially undigested. And now what they do is they take the droppings from the chicken floor and the pig floor and they compress them into tablets that they are now allowed to feed to the cows. And then there's the waste plate exemption. You know, you can't go wasting things when it comes to food. After all, there could be starving people around the world. They have the waste plate exemption. What that says is if you go to a restaurant, you order a steak or any other kind of beef product and you don't finish it, they can take that leftover and they can turn it into food for cows. And you can also take those downer cows and you can grind them up and you can make pet food out of those dead cows. Well, there are some unethical farmers that actually go and buy pet food and feed the pet food to their cows. So in that way, dead, sick cows get back into the, into the cow food chain. Now, you don't want to waste anything. So when you go to the slaughterhouse, you kill the cows, what happens is as a result of killing the butcher and the cows, the blood is pooled and collected. And what they do is they take the blood from the dead cows and dead pigs in the slaughterhouse and they make a formula for the baby cows. Now, all these practices continue because of pressure on the food industry, the beef and the other animal product industries, to make profits. And so they say, their excuse is, we have to do this to be competitive or we'd go out of business. But this is the kind of practices that continue to occur that continue to propagate these diseases such as bovine leukemia, bovine AIDS, as well as mad cow, which is of great concern. Can you imagine there was just one little silly cow in Yakima, Washington that fell down with mad cow disease and the whole world went crazy. Japan stopped buying our beef, many other countries stopped buying our beef, everybody got scared. One little cow got sick with mad cow disease. Can you imagine if people knew that 9 out of 10 herds in the United States of America are infected with bovine leukemia viruses? Can you imagine what the reaction might be? Both viruses can cross species lines and infect other animals. They infect goats, sheep, chimpanzees, and these animals, they get sick. They did an experiment back in 1974 where they took two little, six young chimpanzees and they fed them infected cow's milk and two died within a year of leukemia. Nationwide and worldwide, leukemia is more common in higher dairy consuming populations. There's an increased incidence of leukemia among butchers, dairy farmers, and veterinarians. Now most of the cows that get infected, they don't live long enough to manifest the disease. Only about one to five percent of them live long enough to get actual sickness like leukemia and lymphoma. The other cows, they are slaughtered beforehand so you don't see it in all of them. In the United States, annually there are 30,000 cases of leukemia, there are 70,000 cases of lymphoma, and if you get leukemia and lymphoma, or one of your family members does, and you go to the doctor and you say, and you're going to ask, how did I get this disease? The answer is always going to be, we don't know how you got it. And that's true, they don't know. But could it possibly be a virus? 
I mean, after all, you know that uh, leukemia can be spread by a virus. You go to the veterinarian and take your cat in for a feline leukemia vaccination, don't you? You think it's a problem with your cat? Why wouldn't it be a problem with the cows? And what sense does it make to consume leukemia viruses? I mean, think about it. Next time you walk up to the refrigerator with your child or grandchild, think about it. pouring them a tall, cool glass of leukemia virus. I bet you'll think twice. Now, this has been known for more than 35 years. This was actually discovered in 1969 that the herds were infected with these viruses. The excuse has been by the cattle industry and the United States Department of Agriculture that this is not a problem for people. It's okay for these viruses to be in the cows. It's okay because the tests that we're using show that this infection does not cross over into human beings. And that's been the reason that they have taken no action and has not, have not made this public. Is because the crude tests available have not shown that this is a public health hazard because they cannot identify these viruses in human beings. The bovine leukemia and the bovine AIDS viruses. Well, that's all changed. As a matter of fact, a study published in December of 2003 from UC Berkeley changed all that. They looked at uh, about 250 people from UC Berkeley. They examined their blood by modern techniques. And they found by the presence of antibodies which indicate infection that 74% of people have been infected with bovine leukemia viruses with an antibody response. Other interesting research from the same investigators, when they examined breast cancer cells, they found that 10 out of 23 human breast cancers contain these bovine leukemia viruses. Milk is promoted to children, and it's promoted to children aggressively. You as a parent may say to yourself or to your spouse, you may say, well, it's okay, I'll give up the milk. Because I'm an adult, I'm through growing, but not the kids, not the grandkids. It's absolutely necessary for them to consume milk because of growth. They've got to have healthy bones. They've got to have good health in general. And we know because of years of education by the dairy industry and people who work for them, either directly or indirectly, that it's absolutely essential that you feed kids milk. So what you may not do for yourself, which would be wise, which is to give up the dairy products, you would be very reluctant to do for the kids. I ask you to rethink that. The dairy industry has teamed up with the school board to develop programs to take and sell kids dairy products. And on the internet, you'll find statements as to their efforts. They say the goal is to guide school aid children to become lifelong consumers of dairy products. Dairy Checkoff 2003 makes this statement. The 2003 activities will target students, parents, educators, and school food service personnel to make children lifelong consumers of dairy products. Now, where have you heard a similar statement? To target children to make them lifelong consumers. That's right, for the tobacco industry. Almost the exact words. And the consequences I'm trying to share with you are very similar. Annual milk consumption of children between the ages of 6 and 12 increased to 28 gallons per child per year. Children under the age 18 drink 46% of the milk. Their efforts work. I, I remember as a kid that I was required to drink milk and it was really hard to turn it down. It was only two cents a carton. But I absolutely hated it. I could hardly get through those school milk lunch programs when I had to drink the milk, unless it was chocolate milk. Then I could get it down. Well, that's one of the things, of course, that the dairy industry is doing is they're flavoring the milk with chocolate and strawberry. They're putting fancy cartons and straws and all kinds of promotional deals to get these kids to drink the milk. And they're succeeding. And you as parents, you as consumers, probably believe this is in your children's best interest. It's not. An interesting study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at uh, 65 severely constipated children. Now, to get into that category of severely constipated, you had to have a bowel movement every three to 15 days, and that was almost always initiated with a laxative, strong laxatives. And they took these kids, and they took them off dairy products. 
And what they found is that nearly 70% were completely cured almost overnight by taking the kids off dairy products. When they examined the children's bowels, they found inflammatory reaction in the bowel tissue. They found that these kids had fissures and other things that caused them terrible pain related to the constipation caused by the dairy products. Now they took these children 8 to 12 months later and they put all the kids back on dairy products and all the children who had originally responded redeveloped constipation. Now this isn't just 68 kids that happen to be in this particular study. I used to be a general practitioner. For three years I saw kids. For three years I saw constipated kids in terrible pain. This is a usual problem not just one that appears in the scientific literature. Just for this problem alone, you would think that the school lunch programs, the U.S. government would take and ban these products from the schools just to relieve that simple kind of suffering, which is not only painful but also very embarrassing for a child. You look around your neighborhoods and you see kids with, with snotty noses. You talk to the parents and they're taking the kids to the doctor every month for ear infections. Do you think this is normal? You think kids are supposed to have snotty noses and ear infections? Kids will have uh, gastroesophageal reflux, asthma, eczema problems. This is not normal. This has all been tied to the dairy product consumption that's encouraged by the dairy industry and most of us have bought into. There's a more serious problem that affects kids. It's called type 1 diabetes. Horrible disease. If you, ever would, if you wouldn't want to wish something so terrible on a family as to have a member develop type 1 diabetes, it's not just a disease of children, even though this used to be the most common kind of diabetes in children. These days, because children are getting so fat, they're developing a lot of type 2 diabetes, which is now, it is now becoming competitive as far as the number of cases, type 1 versus type 2. Well, type 1 diabetes is where the pancreas is destroyed. The initiation of that destruction is caused by cow milk protein entering the bloodstream. That's what the scientific research says. In fact, it is so compelling that the American Academy of Pediatrics work group on cow's milk protein and diabetes in 1994 made a statement that still stands today. They said early exposure of infants to cow's milk protein may be an important factor in the initiation of the beta cell destructive processes in some individuals. Beta cells are what make insulin in the pancreas of the child. And they recommended that you stop feeding cow's milk to children to prevent insulin dependent diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Many of you are on the internet and if you go to the internet and you plug in cow milk or cow's milk and some interesting diseases, you'll find that the internet at the National Library of Medicine will take and provide you a tremendous amount of information on how cow's milk, particularly cow milk protein, is associated with many of our common diseases. If you go there and type in some of the following diseases, you'll find some very interesting research that shows that cow's milk is associated with or definitely the cause of various problems that are quite serious and quite common, like canker sores, tonsil enlarged. Well, you think it's normal to have enlarged tonsils? These tonsils are enlarged to take and defend you. What they do is they serve a purpose. What happens is tonsils form a barrier at the beginning of the intestinal tract. And they're there to protect you from invading substances like viruses and bacteria. Well, one of the invading things that comes into the body that's not natural and shouldn't be there is cow milk. Not human breast milk, but cow milk. And so the tonsils enlarge and then they eventually get worn down and infected. There's actually a study done where they took children off of cow milk with very severe tonsil enlargement and the tonsils they shrunk. Vomiting problems, gastroesophageal reflux, ulcer disease, various colic problems, even children that are breastfed. You know children who are breastfed are not supposed to get colic? But they do if the mother consumes cow's milk. And then what happens is the cow milk protein, you can actually measure this in the mother's milk, it goes into the baby's intestinal tract and the baby gets colic. So not only do you have to breastfeed your child, you also have to have a clean diet yourself to prevent this common allergic type of reaction called colic from occurring in a breastfed baby. Lower intestinal problems are quite common also and caused by dairy products such as bloody stools, painful defecation, constipation as I talked to you about, colitis, Crohn's disease and ulcerative sort of colitis have all been associated with dairy product consumption. Respiratory problems such as nasal stuffiness, runny nose, ear infections, sinusitis, asthma, wheezing problems. Bone problems such as generalized nonspecific arthritis. 
rheumatoid arthritis and even juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I want to tell you, if you want to see a sad case, a couple of times in my medical practice I have seen children, young children who have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It's a terrible disease. These children, their bones don't grow. They look like uh, refugees, like little children that would come out of a prisoner of war camp. They're usually in wheelchairs. They have little tiny jaws. Their life is, of course, very short and very painful. I have had two children in my practice who have, their parents have understood the message that this can be caused by callous milk consumption and both those kids were cured of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And by the way, that happens to also be published in a British medical journal. Lupus, other kinds of arthritis, dairy products are what you want to think of first. Skin problems like rashes, atopic dermatitis, eczema, seborrhea, and hives. Nervous system problems such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, autism and schizophrenia. There is research in the scientific literature that you can easily find that talks about the cause of autism from cow's milk consumption and the cure of these children simply by changing their diet. Headache problems, fatigue, mental depression, bedwetting problems. You know that psychiatric problem that your child developed because somehow when you changed his or hers diaper you touched in the wrong place? You know that problem you have to take the child to the psychiatrist to get uh, counseling every month because the child has this psychological problem called bedwetting? Well, I can't tell you the number of parents that write me that say, I've taken the child faithfully to the psychiatrist or the psychologist for years and they continue to wet their bed until I listen to your advice which is to get them off the dairy products. It's well described in the scientific literature. What happens is the children consume the milk goes into their intestinal tract and some kids it gets through the gut into the bloodstream and then it, it is excreted through the kidney system into the bladder. Well in the bladder it causes an allergic type of reaction and what happens is the bladder linings they swell like a giant hive and as a result of the swelling the bladder linings become insensitive so the child can't feel the urine build up in the bladder and so they go to bed at night the urine builds up and the first thing they notice is wet bed sheets. You take the kids off the milk the swelling disappears, the sensitivity returns, and the bedwetting, the psychiatric emotional problem disappears in many of these children. Very simple solution to the problem. Miscellaneous problems such as iron deficiency and anemia, nephrotic syndrome, this is where the children lose their kidneys from a, an allergic type of reaction. Glomerular nephritis where adults also have a similar problems, SIDS, and also hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. A lot of you out there have artery problems. You've made some good changes. You've tried to get the fat and the cholesterol of your diet, and I think that's good. But unfortunately, many of you have not completed the message. You've not really make a, made the step that will really get you to a minimal chance of causing this disease to progress, this closure of the arteries. Atherosclerosis leads to heart attacks and strokes. You switch to skim milk. Yeah, taking the fat of the cholesterol is good, but what happens is the cow milk protein gets into the bloodstream and the body makes antibodies to the cow milk protein that attack the lining of your arteries. And it's found in scientific studies that people who have the rottenest arteries have the highest levels of antibodies directed to cow milk protein in their bloodstream. The dairy industry is well aware of these problems. I've been discussing these problems with them for decades. And their only rebuttal is money. 166 million dollars a year. And that could buy a lot of research, a lot of scientists, and a lot of advertisement, and a lot of misinformation. I introduced you to Dr. Greg Miller in the last lecture. Let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Greg Miller. I mentioned to you he's the Senior Vice President of Nutrition Research for the Dairy Association. He's involved in the Dairy Management Incorpor Incorporation movement where that is uh, the organization that manages Dairy Checkoff 2003, which is out there to promote dairy products for you and your family by designing and carrying out scientific research to, to prove the healthfulness of dairy products. And also, they're out there to promote dairy to your children so they become lifelong consumers. Well, Greg Miller, he's involved in that. Let me tell you how I met him. It was back in the spring of 1993. I did a show national television show. It was on a program called Lifestyle Magazine that I had a regular segment on. 
And I had a guest on the show, his name was Dr. Virgil Hulse. Dr. Hulse was an MD, a PhD, he was a former dairy inspector of the state of California. We talked about the health consequences of the dairy products. Now remember this was 1993. We talked about mad cow disease, we talked about bovine leukemia virus, bovine immunodeficiency virus, we talked about heart attacks and obesity and allergies and problems that you knew about for years related to dairy products. We talked about all those things. In the dairy industry they saw the show. And so they wrote my producer a letter and said we need equal time. And my producer wrote back and said okay fine, you can have equal time. You can be on the show, you can counteract what Dr. McDougall said, but he will be on stage with you. And so we met. We met on Lifestyle Magazine in June of 1993. And we did a half an hour television show. And he said the dairy industry has a fine reputation. They're a trusted industry. And that was the bulk of his argument, except he had one special argument that I want to share with you. And this was the main thrust of why you should believe dairy products are good for you. He wouldn't counteract the fact that the dairy products were full of viruses and other kinds of microbes, that they promote heart disease and obesity and diabetes and other problems. He wouldn't counteract any of that. What his main argument was is about three minutes into the show, he reached into his pocket and he told us why you should consume dairy products. He said if there was any thought that dairy products were in any way harmful, there is no way I would let them consume them. And he showed us a picture of his two children. His two year old consumes milk, yogurt, and cheese regularly, and his five and a half month old is on cow based formula. And that is the argument from the dairy industry as to why you should consume milk, and that is their counter to the scientific evidence. Those two shows, by the way, are shown around the country. They're shown to to various groups of people and they show the Virgil Hall show and they'll say well there must be a there must be an answer that the dairy industry has to this they wouldn't let Dr. McDougall get away with saying these kinds of things well you come on back next week and we'll show you the other show and they show them the other show and they're shocked because they've got nothing to say you know that meat is not health food you know that You've heard how red meat's not good for you, how it promotes heart disease and cancer and all kinds of problems. And most of you, most consumers in this country, even though they still consume it, know there's a problem. But you believe in dairy products. You believe they're health food. I want you to change your way of thinking. I want you instead to think of dairy products as liquid meat. And to make my case, what I want you to do is I want you to compare the macronutrient content, in other words, the large nutrients, between dairy products and meat. If you compare beef to cheese, you find that they're both about 70 percent fat. The amount of protein is very similar, 25 to 30 percent. You found that they have virtually no carbohydrate, they have no dietary fiber, they both have similar content of cholesterol, they have no vitamin C, so if you can put it in that perspective, if you can stop thinking of cheese and milk and so on as health food, as nature's most perfect food, something you never grow out your need for, if you instead can think of it as liquid meat, then you're getting pretty much on target. People bargain with me all the time. They, they come to me and they say, you know, I'm ready to change my diet, but just not completely. So I'll just make some small changes. What do you suggest I give up? You know, should I give up cigarettes or should I give up whiskey? Should I give up dairy or should I give up beef? It's a hard one. But sometimes I have to help them make those kinds of decisions. And one of the hardest decisions for women to make is to give up the dairy group. Men can do it. Yeah. I think it's a gender thing. I hope I don't offend anybody here. But I think it's a gender thing. What I find is that men will tell me that they can give up milk and cheese no problem at all, but not their meat. And what do women say? I've seen this over the years and actually there have been psychological studies to confirm what I have observed and that is that women have trouble giving up the dairy, don't they? And, you know, it's, I think it's because it's kind of a, a traditional woman kind of thing. You know, it's associated with, uh, with mothering, with nurturing. It's a domestic thing. Remember women used to stay around the, the village and milk the cows. It's kind of a homegrown type thing, dairy products. It's a, it's a, a, a home-associated industry, family-oriented. And of course, 
who gets the bulk of the advertising messages from the dairy industry? It's women. You've got to drink it for your bones. That's the primary selling message out there. And so women have the most difficult time giving up the milk. Well, with that in mind, if you were going to bargain with me and you were going to ask, what of the basic four food groups should I give up? Remember the old basic four food groups? Advertising dairy and meat and vegetables and fruits to you? An advertisement, by the way, usually put out by the dairy industry. If you bargained with me and you said, for my better health, for the health of my family, which of the four groups should I give up? Obviously, it wouldn't be the fruit and vegetable, would it? But when it came to the dairy and the meat group, I'd tell you, give up the dairy. Why? Because it has similar problems, as I showed you the macronutrient content, as the meat groups. But it has additional problems, such as the autoimmune and the allergy problems. But the biggest problem is that you believe it's health food. And so you eat it without guilt. And you feed it to your kids that way. And that's very wrong. So I hope I've given you a chance to rethink this. Not only are dairy products not necessary for your health and bones, they're also destructive to your family. And it may be the most difficult message for you to get because there's been so much education, so much effort, so much money putting behind trying to give you the other message. But I promise you that it will be the greatest benefit to you and your family if you can get this correct. You are not a cow. Your children are not calves. You should not be consuming cow's milk. It is a serious health hazard. Thank you very much.